Welcome to episode 32 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. The Changeling. In this week's episode, the Enterprise crew tangle with artificial intelligence as a seemingly sentient space probe comes aboard the ship on a mission to sterilise imperfect biological life. With only Kirk able to engage the machine, can he find a way to dissuade it from destroying first his crew and then all life on Earth? Or is the end of organic life inevitable? The dog has a ball. Oh. Oh. Good evening, Jerry. Ian, how are you doing? Not bad. The dog has a ball. How many do you have? Enough. That's all you need. Yes, there's no awe in ball, I should say. There's no going bit awe. Well, there's no, there's no awe. No. <laughs> we'll get to that particular part of the episode later. Sure. It's a much better episode than last week. Yeah. Wouldn't be hard. No. Interesting, actually, to see them tackling the idea of AI. Um, it's quite popular these days. There's a lot of television shows about it. Even Star Trek Discovery's second season was all about this. This is obviously 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. Tackling the idea in a similar way. Yeah, it wasn't a bad episode. Yeah, it was quite talky. I mean, the first time I watched it, I was just exhausted and I found it hard to follow along. But on a second viewing, I found it much more engaging. Mm -hmm. Engaging enough to discuss for an hour or so yeah there's at least a couple of questionable things we can bring up as well so that'll be fun okay let's crack on in your favorite way we start on the bridge of the enterprise yeah there has been a, a distress call from the Mulurians. yes yeah, it's, it's fairly similar to the beginning of operation annihilate i think where they're heading to this planet and they can't get hold of anyone do you know anything about Mulurians or maluria well they're all dead yeah, so they don't come back into it down the line. No, <laughs> they've been killed. That's so the problem have. with this episode. Yeah, right enough. Yeah, there's been no communications according to Ahura. Kirk asks about the Federation scientific team and specifically uh, Dr. Manway, who had a special transmitter, but Ahura reiterates, nope, nothing. Yeah, he's not quite as narky as he was in Operation Annihilate when it's his brother he couldn't get hold of. Yeah, understandable, I suppose. Of course. Spock has the answer for him, of course. Yeah, what was that? Uh, everyone's dead. They're dead, Jim. Everyone's dead. No signs of life on long-range scanners. And Kirk says, that's impossible. There's four billion people there. But Spock is insistent. Although he can't give any explanation, as all readings, including one from a week ago, were normal. Yeah, he goes through a list of possible causes and rules them out one by one. It's not a catastrophe. Well, there's four billion people dead. Quite you may call it a catastrophe, but... Yes, he's ruled out a natural catastrophe, right. a war, because they probably would have heard about that. And I think there's no background radiation. He also rules out disease. Okay, let's just take a, a step back on it. Four billion. This isn't a, a small colony. Oops, there's a problem. I think we've lost 30 people. Four billion? It's, yeah, well, that's what happens. So, remind me, these Malurians, are these Earth people who have colonised? No, this must be aliens, because there's a Federation colony there. They wouldn't have 4 billion human colonists. Depends how long they've been there for and how... Um, I yeah. think in the context of the series, I don't think there's 4 billion human uh, I mean, colonists I wonder anymore. how long it would take to populate a planet with 4 billion people if you say you started with, let's say, 1,000 uh, people. Someone will be able to tell us, I'm sure. Mm. I reckon about 74 years. You think so? Yeah. And how long has this been... Remind me, how long have the, this whole thing been going for then? So, Well, this is uh, 200 years from now. Yeah, but how long have they known that there's been alien life forms in other planets? Well, we find out in this episode that around about 2002, this probe's been sent out looking for the first signs of life, so not that long, 150, 200 years. Okay. Sulu interrupts him to tell him that the shields have snapped on Otto. That's never happened before. No. I doubt it'll ever happen again. I so do, yeah. Ma yeah. Making this stuff up, aren't you, Sulu? Yeah. So he's talking, he's put them on. He's like, oh, the shields come on by themselves, Captain. Did you, did you press it? But no, no, Otto, 
We, we don't have an auto function. Yeah, we do. Yeah. I didn't give an order for this. <laughs> Something is approaching at high speed and it hits them. Ultra warp speed. Ultra warp. I've never heard of that before either. I don't think that'll ever come up either. No? No. Nah. Ultra warp. Making things up. Yeah. Warp, warp speed is as fast as it gets. <laughs> yeah. Ultra warp. Super ultra warp. High definition ultra warp. Super duper mega warp. 20% of their shields have gone in that attack and Spock predicts they can withstand three further attacks but not four. By my math, they can withstand exactly four more attacks. Yeah, you've just skipped well ahead here. This oh. is after the credits and everything. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that. Calm it's down. The same Calm down. You stop going in ultra warp podcasting mode here. When you get to the end. Spock confirms before all this that it is an extremely powerful bolt of energy. And so the ship is put on red alert as they try to outmaneuver it. Okay. Unfortunately, they are un unable to. And we see a, a luminous green ball hit them with force, causing them all to be thrown about the deck. Reminded me a little bit of Balance of Terror with the Romulan weapon yeah. that just chased them. And this, of course, is one of the, the, the Star Trek tropes, isn't it? When you, you get... Yeah, folk getting chucked around the... Yeah. yeah. We now have the credits. Okay. We're back on the bridge. They've lost 20% of their shields and uh, Spock predicts they can withstand three more attacks, but not four. But I don't think his math is quite right there, Jerry. Explain. Well... Three lots of 20% is 80%. They would still have 20% of their shields left mm -hmm. to withstand a further attack. It's been a while since I watched the episode. Let's, let's get through this. I suppose it's always possible that the fewer shield you are, the more your shields are damaged, the greater the damage is. Yeah. Anyway. Kirk does his usual in situations of dire need. What's that? He gets Uhura to send his log to Starfleet. Just in case. Yes. Scotty. Uh, sorry, but must be quite... Um, Ominous for everyone on the bridge, it's like, oh, we might die sending a record of everything that's happened. Starfleet gets his communication. <laughs> oh, he's he sent another one. Oh, he's a panic merchant. He always sends these and he's always fine. Yeah. Scotty explains that they can't use warp speed as he has had to divert all power to the shields just as they are hit with another blow. Yes, yeah, Sulu's complaining that he can't outmaneuver the weapon because the ship's sluggish and Kirk asks Scotty why he's made this decision and given the speed of the weapon he concludes that Scotty's option was the correct one. Spock still can't identify the source at first but eventually picks up something small in the, the vicinity just before they're hit for a, a third time. They are. So they retaliate with a, a torpedo shot. Does nothing. Well after witnessing a, a blinding light they are stunned to discover yes that there's been no effect. See, I didn't really understand this because I think did Spock not earlier on say the weapon that hit them was worth about 90 torpedoes or something like that? Yeah. So that does 20% damage to their shields, but one torpedo doesn't destroy the other guy and they're shocked. But they've been hit by 90. Yeah, but maybe they've got better defences. Yeah, maybe. Well, they don't know. Obviously, he's got better defences. Yeah. Kirk takes his uh, traditional approach and tries to reason with the attacker. He does, yeah. And I think they actually take another shot. Right after they they counter themselves. Anyway, so Kirk tells Ahura to open a hailing frequency and to use the translator in order that he can tell the enemy that they come in peace and mean no harm. You maybe you should have tried that a couple of shots ago. Yeah, after firing a torpedo at them, you're a bit late. Yeah. He gets no response, but Spock now has some readings. It's only one metre tall, but weighs 500 kilograms. That's not very much either. Scotty is sceptical that life could exist at that scale. But Spock responds by pointing out that uh, intelligence doesn't have to be bulky. It's a fair point. Yeah, not sure anyone thinks bulk is a signifier of intelligence. In fact, quite the opposite. No. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think it's likely to be space-faring insects, but you never yeah. know. They're not unheard of. No one looks at a a brain box professor and thinks, yeah, see that sumo wrestler over there? He's probably smarter because of his size. Larger package. Yeah. A bigger head. More brain. Uhura, at this point, reports that there has been a response to the initial message. Yeah, what was that? Spock says it's a sophisticated form of binary. And Uhura's able to narrow it down to a single repeating symbol. Yes, but this signal is not in the Starfleet code. No, it's a pre-Starfleet code, which translates as repeat. And so Kirk repeats his message 
and request their identification. In return, they get a mathematical message and a request for language equivalence. Yes, their efforts to translate the message cause Spock's station to blow up. Anyway, they finally managed to get a translation, which must have been recorded prior to the explosion. The ship says, this is Nomad, my mission is non-hostile, which is a lie. Yeah, and after some discussion, it accepts Kirk's invitation to come aboard. It does. It doesn't understand everything it's being told, but it does agree to beam aboard the Enterprise. Scotty, he's a bit sceptical. Yeah, I've got a sceptical Scotty, that's what I've written down okay, here. Yeah. Kirk gets a sceptical Scotty, as well as McCoy and Spock, to join him in the transporter room. So that's where we are. They wait nervously as the entity beams up, but seem surprised and unimpressed at what looks like a, a prototype or outline of a a 60s robot floating above the floor. Yeah, a wee satellite, something like that. Mm -hmm. Spock's not able to scan it. It has some kind of shielding. No, but some form of communication does take place. Relate your point of origin. We are from the United Federation of Planets. Insufficient response. All things have a point of origin. I will scan your star charts. Well, if we show it a close-up view of our system, if it has no point of reference, it won't know any more than it does now. A reasonable, of course. If you care to leave your ship, we'll provide the necessary life support systems. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated. Jim, I don't think anybody's in there. I contain no parasitical beings. I am nomad. In my opinion, that's a machine. Indeed. It is reacting much like a highly sophisticated computer. I am nomad. What is opinion? An opinion is a belief, a view, a judgment. Insufficient response. What's your source of power? It has changed since the point of origin. There was much taken from the other. I am perpetual now. I am Nomad. Isn't there a probe called Nomad launched in the early 2000s? Yes. It was reported destroyed. There were no more in the series. But if this is that probe... I will scan your star charts. I will bring them. I have the capability of movement within your ship. Quite like Scotty thinking that he's just realised or worked out that there isn't a little chap in there driving the thing. Yeah, he hopes he was convinced that's what it would be. <laughs> Life can't exist at that scale. I'm looking forward to seeing this. <laughs> Nomad gives an indication here that something has happened to it mm. when it talks about its mission having changed or its power source having changed and it refers to the other yes he's now perpetual mm. as we heard at the end of the clip there kirk invites it to follow him out which it does by floating and kirk advises scotty to get warp power to full capacity and tells spock and mccoy to come with them did you not think it was a bit unlikely that kirk would remember the name of every probe that had ever been launched very unlikely and then later on, the McCoy seems to recall it as well. It's reminded me a little bit of Space Seed. Mm. There was, in fact, the showing of the star charts idea also reminded, reminded me of Space Seed. Yeah. Because they are in the auxiliary control room, I believe. And on the screen, they put up chart 14A and ask Nomad to scan it, explaining that the star known as Sol is their point of origin and confirms that they are from Earth. The third planet, yes. Mm. The chart itself reminded me of the terrible maps we saw in The Devil in the Dark. Yes. Yeah. Like it was drawn with crayon <laughs> on a whiteboard. However, there is some confusion when it claims that Kirk is the creator and it is apparently he who programmed its function. This is quite confusing for Kirk who definitely didn't program its function. Yeah. The other thing is it basically apologises for sterilising them, or for trying to sterilise them. <laughs> Says it was unnecessary. 
At this point, McCoy pipes up and says he is not the creator and wants to know what his function is. Yes, Nomad asks Kirk if this is another of his units. Yeah, with some disdain, he sort of dismisses McCoy. <laughs> this one's irrational, it doesn't work. And with a, a slight smirk, Kirk says yes, causing Nomad to state that McCoy functions irrationally. Yeah. Kirk agrees with him. <laughs> Obviously annoys. He asks him to answer the question anyway though. Yeah. And Nomad says his function is to probe for biological infestations and destroy that which is not perfect. Mm. That'll be important later. It will. Startled at this, Kirk whispers to Spock that no probe was ever sent out for biological infestations. No, and Nomad then causes greater concern when it confirms it destroyed all life in the Malurian system. As you say, it's highly unlikely that these guys will remember every probe, f you know, dating back hundreds of years. Yeah, no, it makes no sense at all because you would imagine that there, there, are, there, there are were hundreds many, of many more of them yeah. yes, as time went on. Anyhow, Kirk questions why Nomad is calling him creator and is very abruptly cut off by Spock. Yeah, he interjects, stating firmly that it, it is correct and that creator was simply trying to test its memory banks. So, yeah, Spock is a, a step ahead here. And He's onto something, yeah. He is, yeah. At this point, Kirk puts a very confused looking red shirt in charge of Nomad. Yeah, Mr. Singh, and that this is the first time, but not the last time in the episode where I think there's been a sort of dereliction of responsibilities that could be avoided. Yeah, they're putting this guy in danger. Yeah, he's just not up to this. It shouldn't be his responsibility to look after this. No, it's not fair. It's not. They have no idea. How they don't even give him any instructions. It's just like, you look after this. He'll, he'll help you out. We're off. Yeah, M M Mr. Singh has... He's no clue what's going on. Anyhow, Kirk and McCoy and Spock leave the room. Yeah, they've got, they're have got. they going for an urgent confab. In the corridor. Where Spock reveals that he has discovered that it is indeed the Nomad probe. Although McCoy ridicules this, stating that Earth science wasn't capable of building such a, such a thing. Yeah, Spock posits that it was damaged but not destroyed as reported and has somehow been able to repair itself. Yeah, I think he makes the point that it was only presumed destroyed. Yeah. Kirk notes once again, though, that Nomad's mission was peaceful. Yeah. Back in the room, Singh looks increasingly nervous. Yeah, but he can't help himself interact with Nomad and is startled when a light flashes on top of it. Yeah, very shocking. A light, do you see? What's, <laughs> what's this magic? This wizardry. Meanwhile, he gets a call from Uhura on the bridge asking him to check in. Yeah. We kind of go back and forth between the two as he checks a system and Uhura sings while waiting for him on the line. It's basically hold music. Yeah, which causes Nomad to get an erection and float out of the room apparently to try and find the source of this. Yes, well, Singh has his back turned. Yeah. I think we find ourselves in the briefing room next. We do. Spock is bringing Kirk and McCoy up to speed on the real creator of Nomad. Yeah, a chap called Jackson Roy Kirk. There's a picture on the screen. Yes, we'll come back to that. Spock describes him as a, a brilliant though erratic scientist who created Nomad to be an independent thinking machine. Artificial intelligence, as you mentioned. Yes, and Nomad, in Spock's opinion, has mistaken this Roy Kirk or Kirk for this Roy Kirk. For such a sophisticated machine, it's like, oh, uh, Kirk is in both names, I'm confused now. Yeah. Not very intelligent, artificial or otherwise. It's obviously damaged the wrong memory bank. So he asks what they know of Nomad, and Spock puts up a graphic on the screen. Well, that's not the same. Essentially, it is, Doctor. I believe that more happened to it than just damage in the meteor collision. It mentioned the other... The unanswered question is, the other what? Nomad was a thinking machine, the best that could be engineered. It was a prototype. Its purpose was certainly altered. Its directive to seek out and destroy biological infestations could not have been programmed into it. As I recall, it wasn't. It was supposed to be the first interstellar probe to seek out new life forms. Precisely, Doctor. And somehow that programming has been changed. It would seem that Nomad is now seeking out perfect life forms. Perfection being measured by its own relentless logic. If what you say is true, then we've taken aboard our vessel a device which sooner or later 
must destroy it. Why can't they just get rid of it? Because it'll chase them down and kill them. And yeah. if not, it already knows the way to Earth. It's going to go there and kill everyone there. But it's not as if it's um, an unstoppable killing machine. Well, it was only one shot away from destroying the Enterprise. Yeah, but they could jump it when it's not looking. They could hit it with hammers or, or do something just to... Well, we're about to find out why they can't do that. Okay. So, with this understanding of the the mission, Kirk communicates with security and orders our team to meet him in the control room in five minutes. But he's informed at this point that Nomad has left the auxiliary control room and they don't know where it is. Yeah, and so Kirk cancels the order and replaces it with one for a full search. Up in the bridge. Yes, Nomad arrives and approaches Uhura as Scotty puts a surreptitious call into the captain. Yeah, it asks her what this communication of hers is, the singing. And being unsure for a moment, she explains that it was just a tune and um, she was performing it because she felt like music. Yeah, she doesn't explain it very well. No. And Nomad takes offence at this and zaps her face. Yes, after asking her to think about music. She's obviously yes. trying to uh, scan, work out what her, her thought process is. Yeah, Scotty tries to intervene and he gets uh, zapped in a different way and is killed. Yeah, he finds himself shot across the room for his troubles. That was a bit like uh, last week. Yes, when Apollo kept chucking him. At least he's a bit more stable this week. Yeah, he's been told, he's been warned. Yeah. Enough of that. And you're not allowed to get anywhere. You've got a, a banning order yeah, that's on it. females other than Ahura. Kirk and Spock show up and Nomad explains to them why men are better than women. He says that the Uhura unit is defective because its thinking is chaotic and absorbing it unsettled him. And Spock explains... But, 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 sure, sure, but why do you think that is... But it wasn't because she was a woman. Well, Spock responds, that's because the unit is a woman. Ah, right, well that's... yeah. Suppose. And Nomad says, it's a mass of conflicting impulses. Yeah. I think that's a very 60s view, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Nomad asks if the Scotty unit is going to be repaired. Well, y yes, but I think he demands to know firstly why uh, it killed him. He's dead. No, Kirk demands to know why, from Nomad why it killed him. Yes. And Nomad asks if it's going to be repaired. And Kirk tries to explain to him that it's not possible. But Nomad's not taking that for an answer. He says he can repair it. He also asks why did it, and it's because he touched his screens. You never touch a Nomad screens. It's a bit like a, a dead man's cheese. Yeah, inappropriate touching has been a theme that's come up in this series previously. Yeah. Thinking right back to Charlie X, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's what you mean. You, t you take that risk. Yes. If uh, Rand had lasers, she oh, could have zapped him. Yeah, without a doubt. And Kirk as well. No doubt. The time when he split into him became a rapist. That's it. Anyhow, on McCoy's instruction at this stage, Spock provides Nomad with the necessary data to rebuild the Scotty unit. Nomad's almost offended, it says that the Scotty unit is primitive and has insufficient safeguards. Now, was this before they sent uh, Ahura to sickbay? I think Ahura goes when they take Scotty's body out. Yeah, it's just before this. Anyhow, Nomad agrees to effect the repair and Kirk orders that Nomad be put under a 24-7 guard. Yeah, he should have done that right at the start. Well, he did. He left Sing in charge. That, no, but that's not good enough. It's like, hey, Sing, uh, you don't, this is the first time you've met this machine. Look Watch after it, it. Yeah. No. Get your best men on it all the time. Explain exactly what the threat is. And in fact, you should be doing this yourself. Watch it get put into a cell. Don't leave it with some random. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. It's like in where no man has gone before when they put Gary in the mm -hmm. prison. Gary. <laughs> Just a... <laughs> no man <and> Gary. <laughs> was it not Gary? Was that his name? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Captain Gary Mitchell. Yeah. But just Gary. She's like, I know. It's like, Ahura, <laughs> Spock, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's yeah. like if you called Jack Daniels Gary Daniels. Well, I was, no, no, I was talking to you about that today. We've mentioned Game One before because of Samantha Janice. We have. Yeah, and I was watching a bit of the weekend and there was a scene where she was drunk and she was laughing and I 100% understood the, the humour where she was making the point that it'd be funny if uh, Jack Daniels was called Paul Daniels. Now, that only, that might not mean a lot to anyone outside the UK, but 
Paul Daniels was a <laughs> not a lot, a but they like it. <laughs> <laughs> it. Was a TV mag uh, magician and not really a Jack Daniels type of guy. But all the marketing campaigns, like, yeah, he's a, he's definitely a Paul Daniels man. <laughs> Give me a Paul Daniels in the rocks. <laughs> oh, Gentleman yeah. Paul. <laughs> Ladies love a Paul, a rugged Paul Daniels man. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so if you don't know who Paul Daniels is, uh, search for Paul Daniels magician and you'll, you'll see that he's not really a... He undertook some magnificent feats. Did he? I don't know. He, he did something in the telly with a truck and I don't know. You're thinking of that other David Blaine? Yeah. No, Copperfield. Oh, and I never saw him in the telly. Yeah. We didn't get that channel. <laughs> he was an arse. I mean, what do you mean say was? Was he? As, I don't know. Oh, you mean Paul Daniels? Probably. And he's dead. So you can have to worry, you can see what you like about him. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to say whatever you want about him. Okay, probably was. Anyway, I'll cut this. Yes. Nomad in Sick Bay now is able to bring scotty back to life which is quite surprising for everybody else yeah he suddenly rises and this obviously delights his colleagues but he's understandably disorientated and quite angry so too is mccoy who is not happy with nomad's perfunctory announcement that the unit is now operating normally yeah he wants to do a full physical exam yeah mccoy gets his nose put out of joint doesn't he yeah i think so yeah he's how's he done that what's happened yeah. here I'm the doctor here. I can't bring people back. Yeah, yeah. We don't need you anymore. We're yeah. going to keep Nomad now as a little pet doctor. Beat it. Nomad, though, cannot fix what it did to Uhura. Why not? Her knowledge banks have been wiped, apparently. But Spock's got a solution. Yeah, he tries to look on the bright side and suggest that as she isn't brain damaged, I'm not sure how they can be sure of that, um, they could simply re-educate her. Now, before we go any further, when I was watching this, I thought to myself, yeah, this doesn't sound lightly. But yeah, and re-education itself has a sort of sinister tone to it, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, of course it does. And in this, in this case, obviously not, but yeah. We're going to send all these gays to be re-educated. Yeah. Anyway, McCoy says he will get right on it. Yeah, but, I don't, he seemed sarcastic at first, but he's well, not. Well, yeah, he should be sarcastic. It's all we'll, we'll oh, yeah, re-educate we'll her. Let's we'll re-educate yeah, her. Fine. Give her. Throw her a couple of books and plug her into the internet. Yeah, we've got online learning now. Yeah, but he can't help himself from having a um, from having another go at Nomad for how he repaired Scotty. Why? He's just jealous. He is bitter. This forces Spock to interrupt before Kirk agrees that Nomad should be held in a, a security cell for the time being. Yes, he at sent, last, finally. Yeah, he sends him with two red shirts. So, because of Kirk's lack of professionalism. Scotty died. Yep. <laughs> and Uhura got her mind wiped. Wiped, yeah. Had Nomad been placed in this cell initially, this could all have been avoided. Should yeah. have been avoided. We should say, when McCoy was ranting at Nomad there, Spock stopped him. Yes. I did say that. Did you? Yeah. Did you say it out loud? Mm-hmm. Well, the tape will tell. It will. Spock now tells McCoy that he interrupted because Nomad would not have understood his emotional outburst. Spock speaking from experience here. <laughs> of course. McCoy walks off and unconvinced as Spock tells Kirk that a study of Nomad would be of tremendous use to them. But Kirk sees it as a killer first and his priority now is rendering it harmless. Yeah, you should have thought of that before. Echoes of Devil in the Dark. Mm -hmm. the, the exact same debate. Yep. I wonder if Spock will go rogue again here. It'd be good. Down in the brig, Spock is examining Nomad and calls it stubborn. Yeah, well, Kirk, at the end of the, the previous scene, ordered him to run a full analysis to find out what makes it tick. Probably its internal clock. Yeah. Kirk instructs Nomad to allow Spock access to its thoughts, or its instruments, I don't know. Yeah. It acquiesces. Noting that Spock is a different type of unit. Mm. A solid unit. Back in sick bay. Yeah, we heard at the top of the show a bit of this scene where Nurse Chapel is working with Uhura. Yeah, this is nonsense, isn't it? Chapel is teaching Ahura some basic reading skills like a child as McCoy enters and beckons her over for an update. Yes, we hear Ahura reverting to her native Swahili tongue. Mm -hmm. And Chapel tells McCoy that she is now a grade one reader with an aptitude for maths and asks if he really thinks that she can be re-educated. He does think that, in theory. Yeah, he's quite positive. 
they watch her and laugh as she struggles with the word blue. Yeah. Mm. Bit weird. So, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get back to this. We will. We'll have to. Mm. It's just, you can't throw a few books at someone and then the time frame here is crazy, which they mention later. I suppose we can wait till then. But even if you re educate her with all the knowledge, it's not, there's no experience. What about the memories? Yeah. Yeah. You can't just give someone pills of books and say, right, that's you, you know it all. The traditional response to that criticism of this episode is that her memories were not wiped, they were just maybe locked away and they are eventually. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. In between episodes. Yeah. Unlocked. Ah, uh, okay. Because by the start of next week, she's fine. Yeah, of course she is, yeah. Back in the, the brig cell, Spock is still struggling to break through in his understanding of what drives Nomad. However, he does have a plan. Captain, I suggest the Vulcan mind probe. Get into direct mental contact with that thing? It seems the only way. You saw what it did to Uhura. There is a risk, but I have formed a partial hypothesis. I must check it out. No man. The unit Spark will touch you. It is not an attack. It is a form of communication. You will permit it. I will permit it, creator. Young man, the unit Spock will touch you. No. It's not an attack. No. It's a form of communication. <laughs> no. You will allow it. <laughs> I don't really want to. Nope, you will allow it. Yes, that's the rules the here. Order. Don't touch me, Mr. Spock. Yes. But Nomad uh, eventually does agree to this. Yeah, so Spock does his thing and we discover that his objective is to sterilise imperfections. Well, we heard that earlier on. It's a, again, very similar to Devil in the Dark. Mm hmm it's, a, it's got a different motive and whatever else, but it's the same approach. Yeah. But this bonding has taken its toll on Spock and Kirk has to jump in and order Nomad to stop and loosen his control on him as he repeats the phrase, sterilise Nomad over and over. Yes, and Spock and Kirk, or Spock stumbles and Kirk kind of half holds him up as they leave the room. Half this episode takes place in the corridor. Yeah. That last bit, it sort of reminded me of Halloween, the end of Halloween 3. When Jamie Lee Curtis is going, sterilise, sterilise. No, oh, back to the corridor. Okay. Kirk helps Spock out and asks what um, we are nomad means. Yes, he explains that nomad is now a combination of two different devices. Yeah, it had its memory banks damaged in a, a meteor collision in deep space. Yes, it met another alien probe of great power and merged with it somehow, repairing one another. So they must both have been damaged in some way. Yeah, this other probe I think was launched from Earth, but um, what was it, to sterilise soil samples? It wasn't launched from Earth, it was launched from somewhere else. Ah right, okay. To sterilise soil samples and when the two merged, it kind of got a bastardised version of the two missions. So instead of seeking biological life or sterilising soil, <laughs> it's now sterilising biological <laughs> life. I find, like, all the combinations like the worst possible outcome. Well, I suppose the, the worst would be if it was just seeking out soil samples. <laughs> That'd be a really boring <laughs> mission. The Adventures of Nomad, the yeah. Soil Seeker. Kirk takes this in and tells Spock it is like the Changeling legend. Uh, a fairy child that assumed the identity of a human baby. I've not heard of this before. I think it's an Irish story. Is it? Yeah. Not aware of it. Anyway, yes. They then accept that by sterilise, it actually means kill. Yes. And it has the ability to do so, as we've seen. Yeah, which of the probes had that ability? Was it the one that was taking the soil samples or the one that was seeking biological life? <laughs> exactly. Why, why giving this thing the ability to shoot? It's a... Uh, I'll, 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 Reference another movie just now, Chopping Mall. No one else has watched that movie. Yeah, oh, they have. I guarantee they have. If, if anyone's watched it, back me up here. Give us a, give us get a, more give us a tweet. Than three people, I will be shocked and stunned. I think we'll, I think we come on, guys. We've got more than three listeners here who have watched Chopping Mall. Anyway, my point is that it was uh, security ga robot security guards for a, a shopping mall which get struck by lightning and they go hey why are oh, they killing play words yeah but the point is that why are we giving them the ability they've got all these you know yeah, there's no need blow things up and kill people so that's not for a, for a shopping mall why it's ridiculous it is 
Anyway. Spock notes that Nomad is well equipped for this new mission and Kirk responds that it's not infallible. And this is evidenced by the fact it thinks that Kirk created it. Yeah, I mean, Nomad thinks Kirk is his mother. Yeah, which shows he's able to make errors. Mm. After this, they wander off and Nomad simply flies through his force field and leaves the brig after killing the two red shirts that are watching it. Yeah, that's pretty much what happens. Yeah. It's useless. <laughs> yeah, and the force field was also useless. Again, I feel that Kirk is he's not weighed up the severity of the situation. He's, he's not, not done a risk assessment. Not at of all. Any kind. And Spock just keeps saying, yeah, seems like a good idea. Yeah, that's yeah. fine, Captain. So two guys have died because Nomad was inadequately restrained. I think this is one of those ones, we've talked about this in the past, Kirk will go on experience and instinct. And yeah, but he's got an experience it, of making bad decisions. Yeah, well sometimes it pays off and other times it doesn't. And it's quite good to know that it's not one of those shows where Kirk always makes the right decision. True, but however, if I was uh, part of his, uh, his, his crew, I'd be saying, that's fine. But every time you make a bad decision, it's not you that dies. My track record shows... <laughs> Anyhow, Nomad enters engineering and Scotty has somebody else call Kirk this time. So like, I'm yeah. not telling him this one. And after causing a bit of disturbance, it, it shows it's, you know, it's got its uses by improving parts of the system so much so that the ship is now travelling at warp 11. Yeah, it can't handle that. It can't. Nomad no. hasn't assessed the structural integrity that the <laughs> of the ship. Yeah, so Kirk enters and orders Nomad to stop this. Then Spock appears and tells him about the, the breakout and the, the dead guards. Yeah, and Nomad says they were inefficient. This enrages Kirk. Yes, he tells Nomad that he is the creator and he is biological. This just confuses Nomad, he's no idea what Kirk's ranting about. Yes, I think he, he realises he's starting to lose it, so Kirk composes himself and orders it back to the waiting area with two guards who he has told he or it must not harm. Don't kill these ones. These, definitely, these, these new two guards. We'll let you off with killing the other two guards, just don't kill <laughs> this guard. These new two must be thinking, uh, Captain, are you sure? It's just killed, and it, it, it killed Scotty as well. It's okay, I've told it not to kill you. I, I'm not really comfortable with this. Guard it. I, I must insist, I'm not comfortable. Can you please, no. Nope. It's an order. Yeah, okay. I don't think that uh, Spock's altogether convinced by Kirk's decision there. No. I think Nomad makes a, cl uh, a claim here that it is programmed to investigate. And so Kirk tells it he is giving it new orders. I keep wanting to say him. It's not a him, is it? Not really. It's got a male voice, but it's not got a gender. This doesn't quite work out as Nomad insists that he will have to reevaluate things. But he does leave as requested and... I think this is the second time there's a, a nice different camera, sort of POV shot from behind him. Yeah. I've tried something different there, which I appreciated. I mean, the whole thing's quite impressive with for the, the time of... Do you know anything about how they got the... Flo I take it's just on wires. Yeah, it'll be on an invisible string. Yeah. You can definitely not see in the original footage. Right, okay. <laughs> in any case, with it gone, Kirk ponders what it was referring to in terms of the reevaluate, And they come to a disturbing conclusion. Reevaluate? I suspect it is about to reevaluate his creator. Captain, it may have been unwise to admit to Nomad that you are a biological unit. In Nomad's eyes, you must now undoubtedly appear imperfect. It was a foolish mistake. Even worse, Nomad just now made a reference to its launch point, Earth. So do you think it's possible that it got a fix on Earth when it tapped the computers earlier? I do not believe there is much beyond Nomad's capabilities. And we've shown it the way home. And when it gets there... It will find the Earth infested with imperfect biological units. And it will carry out its prime directive. Sterilize. We then get the only captain's log of the episode. Just a recap of literally what we have just heard. With very unprofessional language. Was it? He calls it nightmarish. That's not a log. You can't call something nightmarish. That's not in any way a term that they can analyse in the future when you're killed. I don't know. It's like, we're trapped in a horror movie. <laughs> we're back in the, the corridor. I like it this week, don't they? The old corridor scenes. Yes, Nomad uh, decides it's not going to follow the guards anymore. And when they say, come on, Nomad, it kills them. There was no way to predict this. 
It's a shocker. And whilst I ultimately blame Kirk, we have to take some responsibility. It just deviates, but rather than saying, okay, we, we, better, inf we better inform Kirk or someone else to see what he wants us to do, they pull out their, their phasers. Yeah, they antagonise it. Yeah. Asking for it. Yeah. Basically. You know what this, you, know, you should know what this thing can do. You're wearing a red shirt. Be more careful. <laughs> they should have had senior staff members with them. Kirk should have taken, or, or Spock or one or the other, should have taken personal responsibility. Yes, but then they'd be dead and that would ruin the story. Mm. Elsewhere, Kirk is summoned to sick bay but can't get in. Why not? The doors are locked. Mm. Open them then. He tries to, but before he can get anything done, they open by themselves and Nomad floats out. Yeah, I think he's went up a few levels to sick bay. Yeah, Kirk is no longer able to get Nomad's attention though, which is not encouraging. And is this where we find Chapel? Yeah, well, Kirk then goes into sick bay where McCoy is holding Chapel, who's in shock. She had tried to stop Nomad accessing Kirk's personal files and medical histories. Yeah, and he now acknowledges that it must mean that Nomad will have discovered the creator is also imperfect. Spock suggests that the re-evaluation of it may be over. It might have formed a new conclusion. However, before they can consider things further, Scotty communicates through that all life support systems are down and manual override has been blocked by a source from engineering. Yes, and given that Riley died, it must be Nomad. So Kirk tells him to grab some anti-gravs, I've not heard of this before. That's just a convenient plot device. Okay, and meet them down there. Yes, Kirk enters engineering where everybody is unconscious. Quite a lot of red shirts slumped over their consoles. As he approaches Nomad to demand that it repairs the life support systems. Now, here's the thing. Why did Kirk not insist on Nomad repairing the other guards, the red shirts that it killed? Well, he first of all asks for life support to be restored and it's like, no. No, but even earlier on. Well, he, he disintegrated them, didn't he? Uh, oh yeah, did they? They assumed they were dead because they had been dissolved and there right. was no sign of them. Yeah, that's f fair enough. Okay. Yeah, as you said, he Kirk tells Nomad to repair the life support systems. He's ignored. Basically. And then Kirk gets into his traditional speech about man versus machine. Well, I think first of all, Kirk goes to try and fix things himself. Yeah, but he's not able to do that. No, Nomad tells him to stop and he tries to justify it. I don't think he understands or it understands how it will be taken. But he says, well, what I've done here, I've shut down life support systems. Everyone's going to die. The ship will be fine. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? That's 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 the uh, uh, directive here. Yeah, I'm doing what I was meant to. Mm -hmm. Kirk explains to Nomad, no, your programming has been altered and you're in error. Oh, no, no, it, it says Kirk's in error, mm -hmm. but does still accept that he is the creator. Yeah. Kirk goes over and checks on one of the, the red shirts. I think he's dead. Ah, probably or unconscious anyway. Doesn't bother trying to get him revived this time? No. He's not important enough. So he tries to use logic on Nomad by reminding him that he was created by a, a biological unit. Nomad can't reconcile this and simply rejects the question. Or the proposition, you might say. Yeah. I think he did not say he's going to try and analyse it. Yeah, and then he just doesn't. And as it does, Spock and Scotty enter. Nomad concludes this task of his, but yeah, as you say, he still can't provide an answer, so reverts to claiming that he is perfect and he must sterilise those that are not. Yes. He then declares he's going to Earth, where he's going to sterilise it of any anything imperfections. So at this point, Kirk plays his hand and uses a bit of a logic. How do we... We've seen this before from Kirk. We saw it in Archons. Mm -hmm. I think there might have been a previous time. Yeah. Certainly. It's his go-to method when it's a man versus machine discussion. So how does it play out? He makes Nomad admit that where there is error, it must be sterilised. And then reveals to Nomad its own error in identifying him as the creator. He then lists a couple of 
additional subsequent errors that have stemmed i mean if you were being pernickety it's really just the one error yeah and he's trying to string it out a little bit to make it seem worse nomad starts to internally struggle with this and stops whatever he was doing and while it is confused and trying to analyze this new logic they attach these two anti-gravs yes and kirk goes full uh, johnny cochran and it's like if the logic does not fit <laughs> you must destroy yourself they run with it to the transporter room and send it into deep space yes well it continues to compute and shortly after they beam it into deep space it completes its computations it does and blows itself up it took a, a chance there they would have no understanding of how long that process would have taken it might have blown up no. right in front of them and the idea that they can beam it far enough away that that explosion didn't affect them is completely out of sync with any other use of the transporters yeah is it yeah they couldn't send it that far away yeah. there's no effort made to get us out of here or anything like that mm -hmm. you would think you'd be on the the blower to Sulu saying as soon as this transport's complete maximum warp the other direction yeah that would have been a one-liner would have made that seem a bit more sensible mm -hmm. anyhow up on the bridge there's a, a nice exchange between kirk and spock yeah spock congratulates kirk on his dazzling display of logic and admits that he didn't think he had it in him no it's uh kirk says you didn't think i had it in me did you spock and he says no <laughs> sir mccoy then enters yes he reports that uhura has reached college level and she'll be back at work next week now yeah we've, we've, made, we've made the point already but I, I just don't buy this at all it's like he's growing a clone or something yeah it's like oh yeah it's in incubation it'll be up to full speed now do you remember the pilot in from tomorrow is yesterday i think yes they said oh we can't keep him here there's no way he'll be able to he doesn't have the knowledge surely if it was this simple they could just uh, re-educate yeah, him they're basically putting new knowledge onto empty memory boards oh, rather yeah. than ones that are already occupied by nothing or the junk even yeah okay or other knowledge or misunderstanding mm. or primitive understanding spock does however rue the missed opportunity to study the remarkable nomad yes it had much potential but kirk notes it could have killed billions more and then makes a joke about being its mother yes he pretends to uh to feel some sort of regret at losing a bright and promising son who would have made a terrific doctor yes and that's it on to the next adventure yeah yeah i thought this was a, a fine episode it was a good study of artificial intelligence without mm -hmm. the obviously sexist part in the middle it would yeah. have been even better do you think there was a better solution that they passed up um other than just trying to destroy it themselves when they had a chance but no probably not deactivate it or something yeah maybe reprogram it we didn't have to kill it as as what pointed out it was a an opportunity missed yeah in terms of you know that's their goal isn't it going out into the the universe and, and finding these sort of things out and expanding knowledge bases well, exactly the other questions i had were just addressed during the episode where did it get its weapons and what's going on with the hura what has she lost her memory or just her knowledge the whole ahura we, we could have lost that i think yeah it was just stupid it was they could have spent more time with sing instead mm -hmm. they could have spent some more time training their security guards not putting them at such risk yeah they're terrible kirk has lost what was that so how many people many many yeah there was at least well th let's say the ones in engineering weren't dead mm. so he's lost at least four yeah i think the ones in engineering were dead in which case he's probably lost closer to 10. Mm -hmm. that was avoidable so poor showing i think about the paperwork uh, yeah he, he, he wouldn't have paper. he'll dump them in and the yeoman so, will be doing it so what did they do that's the thing did they have a space funeral yeah do you just bury them at sea effect like you know and spit them in space fire them out i think it'll depend on how far they are from a starfleet facility if yeah. they're in deep space with no contact they would just yeah shoot them out into space i think leave them floating forever yeah skeleton. in a coffin probably yeah descending over time you just get a skeleton floating by yeah that's that's definitely what happens should be hmm okay there we go yeah that's us no more to say just a trivia now if you want it always okay the original air date 29th of september 1967 
And like last week's episode, The Changeling was directed by Mark Daniels. <laughs> Paul Daniels. Paul Daniels' older brother. This was the seventh of his 14 Star Trek episodes, so we're halfway through them. And we discussed him in more detail back on the podcast for The Man Trap. And it was Daniels' image that was used to portray Jackson Roykirk, Nomad's creator. Paul Daniels would have been a good creator. They should have put his photo up for yeah. Jackson Roykirk. <laughs> John Meredith Lucas was the writer for this episode. He would go on to both direct and produce shows or episodes of Star Trek. This was the first of four that he wrote. He also wrote for shows like Mannix and Kojak and he died in 2002 at the age of 83. Vic Perrin, you may know the name, you may not. He voiced Nomad. He also voiced The Keeper in The Menagerie and The Metron in Arena. I think he did a lot of... Uh Scooby-Doo type of stuff as he well. He was a vocal or a voice yeah. actor. He did a lot of stuff for people who've watched cartoons from the 60s, 70s and 80s, particularly superhero cartoons like mm -hmm. Spider-Man, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk. There you go. He died in 1989 at the age of 73. McKee K. Blaisdell, or Blaisdell McKee, depending on how you uh, read it and where you're reading it. He played Singh. He wasn't Indian. He was Hawaiian. This was his second appearance on the show where he played Spinelli in Space City. He wasn't Italian either. Mm. He also appeared in shows like Ironside and Mission Impossible, as well as playing the title character in the cult Mormon classic film Johnny Lingo, <laughs> okay. which is big amongst Mormons, I'm is assured. It? Yeah, huge, right? but only for Mormons. Yeah. He died in 1988 at the age of just 56. There's no Colombo connection this week other than the usual mm. Shatner and... We have a check off this week. It's a Sulu episode this ah, week. Right. Uh, yeah, Shatner and, and Nimoy, obviously. The first Star Trek movie has a fairly similar concept to this. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Come back to that. I'll not say anymore. No. Uh, Nichelle Nichols had to put up a fight for Uhura to revert to Swahili when she had her memory or her knowledge wiped as her traditional first language. The director didn't like the idea and I think Gene Rodman had to come in and take sides. Mm. Bill Blackburn, you've heard that name before. He appears all the time. I think he's in every episode more or less as additional crew. In this episode he's seen in all three different uniform colours, presumably playing different people each time. Mm -hmm. In terms of international titles, the Italians chose La Sfida which means the challenge. In Spain, it was La Transformación, which is the transformation. I don't know what that means. And in Japan, it was the um, the option to go for Chokogata Ochusen Nomado no Natsu, which translates rather charmingly as Secret of Nomad, Ultra Small Spaceship. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Next week, fourth episode of season two, an iconic episode, Mirror Mirror. Hmm. It's uh, based on Snow White. Yeah. And in the meantime, you find us all over social media. We're at Trek Podcast on both Twitter and Instagram. And that's how you can find us on Facebook as well. And if you want to find any of our episodes, they are on our YouTube channel, as well as our website, where you'll find show notes for each and every episode. And you can leave your thoughts and comments. That's www.astartrekpodcast.com. Okay, until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.